rise of quantum machines. Uh, but the number one question that comes to people's mind, why? What's wrong with our computers, including the one that we're using right now? So before I tell you what's right and what's wrong, I want to share with you some of the results of playing a game that you play online. It's uh, the game of tic-tac-toes. A uh, really simple game everybody can play. Um, it's called actually Pushkvorky if you are from the Czech Republic. So, uh, yeah, exactly. So I played 24, 24 games in a row. Um, I, uh, there was a tie between the computer and I in 12 games. I lost three games and I won nine games. And I guarantee it to you, if you play this game right now online against that machine that's available at your fingertips right now from the web, you will do a lot better than I did. Okay, so the argument here, what I'm trying to say is, these machines we can defeat today. Somebody could come and say, well, we're not really sure about whether you're going to play against a smart machine, whether this machine is, uh, you know, the, the designer of the game was doing a great job programming the game really well. So, I'll tell you point taken. Now I'm going to share with you another story about a really smart machine. A machine that was developed by IBM to defeat the world champion of chess. This machine was specialized in chess. It was a supercomputer that was equipped with all the dark magic and witchcraft that IBM were able to put together in that machine to defeat Kasparov. So they agreed to play six games match. So in these six games, whoever wins the majority of the games wins the, game, that wins the match. So the first game Kasparov played against this machine that we call, they call Deep Blue, guess what happened? Who won the game? Kasparov or the machine? Kasparov. No, the machine won the game first, and that was a, a turn of event. So you could imagine the world was going crazy. We developed AI who can defeat the world champion of chess. But guess what happened after? The next three games, Kasparov defeated this machine miserably. Three games to one. Now remaining two more games to decide. So what happened at the end, the, uh, Kasparov lost a game and the machine won a game. The final result of this game was four to two, Kasparov obviously won. So what I'm trying to tell, you, to tell you here is that these machines that we have today, we can definitely outsmart. If you are as smart as Kasparov or just as humble as myself, we still can defeat these machines. Okay, so now I'm, I'm bringing you here to talk about quantum machines. So what is it that we can do differently with these machines? Suppose we play a game of coin flipping, and I actually have a coin here that I got from a friend of mine here, Ruth. So uh, here she is. So um, there was this professor who designed the game to play against a quantum machine and gathered 379 participants. And those people played the game of certain rules. I'm not going, go, going over the rules. But what happened, they wanted to play that game and if the computer guesses the series of, of these coin flips, the computer wins. If, if, it, if it's unable to miss one, it will lose. So among the 379 people who played that game, 370 people lost. That's 97%. Um, and the remaining 3% were due to system error. They were not due to uh, intelligence. So now let me tell you what is wrong with these machines. The machines that we have today see the world in black and white, see the world in head and tails, see the world as on and off. Imagine all the color that we have today. I am wearing something co colorful, everyone's wearing something colorful, but our machines are unable to see the color in the world. So I give that example yesterday. If you really want to imagine what these machines can do, if you enjoy cooking like I do, imagine you have a stove, and that stove you put your pot on, you can either turn the heat all the way up or turn it off. You don't have any way in between. So imagine the amount of maneuvering you're going to have to take the pot off of the stove and put it back on because it doesn't want to get too high. Or you put it on and then your food burns. So this is exactly the kind of processing that we're doing with the machines that we have today. It's unable to do something that the quantum machines are able to do. They are able to explore these possibilities, probabilities of the coin flip being flipped in the air. The computer is able to, um, to predict all these probabilities in real time and till, until the coin ends up being a, a head or a tail. So this is what we call superposition. If you're getting something out of my talk today, remember superposition. This is what gives us all the color that we need in the world to express the problems that we have or are unable to solve. So if, if I tell you right now, all these machines are powerful, that's great. And they are undefeatable, that is wonderful. What can we do with this? What can we defeat? 
The number one thing that keeps defeating us is cybersecurity. Imagine now if we are able to design these encryption keys that we send them in the network and nobody is able to intercept them. Or if, if, if they are able to intercept them, they are not able to break them because they, they, they have to solve the quantum mechanics laws and they need forever. The second important thing that we actually need to think about since we are in the pharmaceutical world is solving molecular problems, solving <coughs> problems related to drug discovery, drug design. So now we have these all intractable problems that if you actually go to Wikipedia and search for the million dollar prize, you might want to think about being rich, but you won't. Because these problems are known to be intractable because they are non-polynomial hard. They cannot be solved because they are they need in the time that we have in this universe and they will not be solved. So these machines that we uh, that we have today and the quantum machines can solve these current, current problems. So somebody could come and say, wait just a minute, we've been solving drug design problems all the time. So what happens with, with all these machines? What have, what have we been doing? We've been trying to make a light bulb out of candlelight, and we're not very successful. So we've been trying to accelerate solving similar problems, but they're not exactly with the same scale. We're seeing the problems in black and white. Now if we're able to solve, we are able to solve these problems in color using quantum machines. So clearly there's a system failure here, and Neo knew it all along. So <laughs> I'll, tell you, I'll tell you what Neo said so I can, uh, I can guess. So anyways, Neo said at the end of the matrix, I know you're out there. I know you're afraid of change. But what I'm going to tell you right now that I'm going to show those people what you don't want them to see. I'm going to show the world. I'm going to show you guys a world without boundaries, without rules, where everything is possible. And that's the rise of quantum machines, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you.